Okay, Daniel, here we sit days before the big day for you. How are you feeling as you're getting ready? Um, well, I'm, I'm probably feeling a mixture of uh, nervous and uh, excited uh, for what's been, you know, an 18 month journey and finally getting to unveil uh, all of these great uh, new product updates. So, so what excites you most? Because people looking at the platform would say, I've used Spotify, it seems to be working fine, but you looked at it and you thought what? Well, you know, we hear time and time again, the same things, both from consumers and creators. So from consumers, we're, uh, we, we hear, you know, help me find great new music, help me find great new content, and help, help me find great ways to connect with my favorite artists. And from the artist side, uh, it has always helped me grow my audience, help me engage with my audience, and help me monetize those audience. And um, we thought long and hard about what we could do to develop the platform further. And one of those ways is obviously this now redesigned Spotify that I think delivers on both the consumer side of the needs and the creator side of the need as well. You said Spotify is the best home for creators. You can establish your career and where the world can be inspired by your creativity. But this is my favorite line, a place where you can thrive and grow no matter what stage you're at. I could see people sitting at home thinking, Daniel Eck, I have some ideas. Yeah. What do you mean by a place where you can thrive and grow no matter what stage you're at? Well, I, I, th I think it's important that Spotify is uh, the creator's home and we're really open for business for all creators of all sizes, whether you're just starting out or whether you're already a well-established creator and just want more avenues to reach new audiences and engage and monetize that art. Mm -hmm. And so um, the real thing here is we're providing um, tools and opportunities for creators, uh, even from when they're young and starting out all the way up to super well established. But what makes you different, Daniel, than the other kids in the class? Because you're not the only content creators, you're not the only music choice, music platforms that people have. What makes you different? Well. Um, again, we're uh, an experience that's focused on deep engagement and listening, but also uh, a very big part of what we're focusing on um, as well is for people who aspire to be professional or are already professional. Mm -hmm. So we're not the place perhaps where you connect with friends or, or express uh, you know, a funny video, but we are a place where you can share your art, you can engage with fans, and you can monetize that art better. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the monetized part, because you know, everybody I know likes to make money. Everybody, myself included. So when you say monetize, what does that mean? Well, um, how does that work? Yeah. So depending on if you're a musician or a podcaster, so you have everything from the opportunity here of participating in uh, our revenue streams. One of them is, of course, advertising. And if you're a musician, you can also participate in our subscription programs as well, where we pay out over 70% uh, of the revenue back to uh, rights holders, like um, you know, labels and publishers uh, amongst uh, others. But let's pick up on that, Daniel, because still, it, it's still been an ongoing criticism about Spotify, that the artists don't get what they deserve, that the artists are not paid enough. What do you say to that? That seems to have been a running criticism from the very beginning with Spotify. Yeah, and I, I think what was probably fair in hindsight is this is a new model and a, quite a dramatic shift from how the music industry uh, worked before. And we certainly could have done a much better job explaining uh, what streaming is and how it worked. Uh, but the last few years, we've uh, really amped up on our transparency. Uh, and we have a program now called Loud and Clear that really sets the record straight. Uh, and we have some new numbers that we're updating today. So if you look back and you think about Spotify from the origin up until today, mm -hmm. we paid out uh, now almost $40 billion back to the music industry. And we're the number one revenue generator for the entire recorded music industry at this point. Wow. And then in addition to that, as I mentioned, over 70 cents on each dollar or about 70 cents on each dollar goes back to that music industry as well. So I feel like it is working and it's working on a scale that is never worked on before where more artists, big and young alike, are succeeding. So just one stat, which I think is interesting. So the artists that are making more than a million dollars a year and the artists that are making over $10,000 a year, that number has more than doubled in the last five years. 
So more and more artists are finding success than mm -hmm. ever before. Well, why do people still think, many people still think Spotify doesn't pay the artists? Who should they direct their, their inquiries to, if not to you at Spotify? Yeah, well, technically it is true that we don't pay artists directly. Um, so what we do is we pay all the rights holders. So we pay the, and is, the record, labels, record labels, yeah, yes. record labels, but also the music publishers. So sometimes when I sit down with artists um, and, and they sort of tell me... Um, I what, didn't get paid. Uh, yeah, uh, as an example. It's, it's very hard because, again, they have their deals. They have their, their deals with their record companies and their deals with their publishers, etc. Et and what Spotify does is we pay out to those record companies and these publishers and, and don't know what individual deals these artists may mm. have. So is it fair to say if artists have a complaint about not getting paid, it shouldn't be directed at Spotify, it should be directed at the record labels? Well, again, uh, you know, we're happy, obviously, to talk to any individual creator yeah. that is asking about payouts. And of course, they should also talk to their record companies and, and music publishers as well. What do you think about Drake's recent proposal? He said he had, I think, 75 billion streams or something gazillion streams yeah. and he said you know when you when you're at that level maybe they should be paid like athletes mm. you know that it's they should get bonuses is that something that you subscribe to um i i don't know I, that i've seen that proposal what he proposes but um I, again many of the artists that are of the drake statures obviously have very different type of deals yeah. than uh, maybe an artist that's starting out but Again, those are deals that they make with their record companies and publishers. Mm -hmm. um, on Spotify's part, it's actually all the same for us. We pay just as much if it's Drake as if it is uh, an up-and-coming artist as well. Mm -hmm. Does it frustrate you that people sometimes blame Spotify? Well, or do you think that just comes with the territory? I, I, I think it comes with the territory uh, to a certain extent. And then again, where I take responsibility is um, I should have spent a lot more time up front um, trying to be more transparent and communicate this. And it's a complex subject and it's not easy because there's many facets to this. As I said, we're paying out um, mm -hmm. you know, a percentage of our revenue that goes to lots of different uh, royalty holders and that in turn then gets divided up to artists, etc. So it's a complex topic, but I wish I would have handled it up front. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to change a narrative once mm -hmm. that narrative has established itself. That's, mm -hmm. I guess, the lesson learned from my side. When we're talking about uh, putting more money in artists' pockets, what do you, you have other ways of doing that other than just paying them? Yeah. So, I mean, um, I, I think that the future um, of Spotify will be one where um, all creators will not judge just by just one revenue model, but where they can actually build their home and have multiple revenue models. So if you think about it from a music artist point of view today, um, you know, again, the recorded music is one revenue source that they have, but they also have live touring, uh, which is a major one for them, and they have merch. Uh, as with well. t-shirts and stuff. I buy a t-shirt at every con every concert. Go yeah. ahead, yeah. Um, and, and so um, what we have... And Spotify facilitates that? Yeah, we, we, we're facilitating that and we're making it easier and easier so that, for instance, if you're a fan of um, a certain artist... Harry would, Styles. Harry Styles, we would suggest... Beyonce. Yeah, Beyonce. <laughs> we would suggest when either of those are close enough to you mm -hmm. uh, and you can basically go straight from there and buy a concert ticket but we would also be able to say hey gail you're actually the top one percent uh, listener of Beyonce, um, so we might be able to give you special access here to some mm -hmm. tickets. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows both a greater artist experience, right? Because they want to make sure their top fans have a better experience, but they also want to make engagement sure... engagement for the, for the fans as yeah, well. Yeah, and it's a, a nice treat, you know, if you're a super fan that you get treated a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So we're allowing for that sort of interaction between artists and fans to happen in more ways than one, and more revenue models also for creators to be able to sustain their, their mm -hmm. artistic endeavors. The thing that can't be disputed is the number of uh, users that Spotify has. You have, you have to be doing the hula around here about your latest numbers. What are they? Yeah, so uh, we're, we um, announced today that we've uh, passed over half a billion users. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a, a milestone that I'm incredibly proud of. Uh, I'm proud of the team for achieving. and kind of been a dream ever since we started out Spotify back in the day. I know, but Daniel, let's just let's just take a pause on that for just a second. 
half a billion users. What does that mean to you? I mean, that number is so big. It's like, it, 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 we should have a head exploding emoji over your head, <laughs> yeah. uh, over your head right now. Yeah. What does that mean well, to you personally and it, professionally? It, it, it's, it's crazy to make it, um, to, to, to even fathom and understand uh, that number. But uh, what I will tell you, Gail, is um, in the early days of Spotify, when we looked at uh, what the potential one day would be, the biggest platforms on the internet back, back at that time had about a half a billion users. Mm -hmm. So we, the big, hairy, audacious goal we set out for ourselves is what if one day uh, we could be there too. Uh, and it's surreal and quite crazy to imagine we're now here. And now, obviously, being the restless entrepreneur that I am, uh, we've then extended that goal to now get to a billion people uh, <laughs> before 2030. So that's what we're, we're chasing at the moment. Are you a restless entrepreneur? Is that how you see yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I'm probably my own toughest critic. Um, and uh, the people closest to me would probably say I'm never satisfied, which is both a blessing and a curse, I think. So it's it's one of those things that I'm trying to reflect on much more, uh, having you know turned 40 and trying to be more mature in my life to <laughs> to celebrate successes, especially the team successes, um, a lot more than perhaps I've done in the past. Well, Daniel, you started this company when you were 22. You're now 40, but at 22. What were your visions? What were your dreams at 22? You clearly were a disruptor back then. What were you thinking? Well, I, um, like most 22 year olds, I thought I could take on the world and beat it and didn't think, uh, didn't understand why everyone uh, was, uh, you know, uh, so slow and hadn't done what I already had imagined. Uh, so you have uh, perhaps too much confidence in your own abilities and too little understanding about the rest of the world, but that is quite often a successful um, attribute when you think about entrepreneurs is if you'd known how hard things would have been, you probably would have never done it. Mm -hmm. So not actually knowing probably saved me many times. Um, and, and then I think uh, for me, it's like, you know, when it came to music, um, I felt like I was already living in the future mm -hmm. because Sweden at that time, we had a super fast broadband connectivity. Um, we had, you know, probably 10 megabits internet connections, which is now commonplace. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had that 1997 uh, in my own house. And um, so what I was consuming was obviously lots of content, but the services weren't around mm -hmm. to do that. And so it was kind of obvious to me that something like um, a Spotify would exist in the world. And I couldn't figure out why that hadn't happened. Um, and with so much piracy in the world, it was obvious to me that you couldn't fight piracy by suing um, your customers, which is what the music industry was doing at that time. But you had to build something that was better than piracy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, you know, that was really the kind of inspiration of Spotify. And, um, you know, there are some entrepreneurs that magically um, just can come up with entirely new concepts and ideas. Uh, I'm, I wish I was that, but I'm not that type of person, but I am the person that can take something and know intuitively how it can make it better. Um, and, um, and it was just so clear to me. It was like, you know, this is obvious and this is the way it should work. And that's what I built on. Well, it was obvious to you, but at 22 people, it's not like they said, Daniel Eck, what a great idea. <laughs> yeah. People said free music. Are you crazy yeah. streaming? Yeah. Get out of here. In fact, you were rejected pretty soundly in the beginning. Yeah. Did you ever think about quitting? Many Along times, way, did you? Many, many, many times. Um, it was rough. I mean, the first two and a half years, um, it was just constant rejection after rejection after rejection. And there was many times when I wanted to give up um, along the way, but um, I, I, I don't even know why I kept going, but I think it was kind of this idea that uh, if we could pull it off, it would be uh, amazing. And then you know, I, again, I, I come back to what I said earlier. I think um, I, I don't know of a single entrepreneur that um, if if you would go back to them now and ask them if you knew everything you know now, would you do it again? And the answer certainly for me, but I 
think for unilaterally for all entrepreneurs I've been talking to has been like no, <laughs> because it's so hard. There's it's such an emotional roller coaster, up and down, up and down, and it never stops. It's just up and down. Yeah. You you wouldn't do it again. Um, this way. No, I'm not. I'm not sure to be honest. Really? It's not because it's not been worth it. It's been yeah. the most gratifying thing I've ever done in my life, besides my kids. But um, and your wife and my wife. She's of lovely. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, but but it's it's it, it's not for the faint-hearted, and it's the sacrifices you're doing as well. All the friends' birthdays, all the uh, parent-teacher conferences, all the normal things you. Mm -hmm frankly have to uh, um, you know prioritize work over uh, that's hard and you're constantly living with that thing where uh, at any moment there's a phone call uh, there's a crisis going on there's something you need to do uh, and that's 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 hard you said they're like what did you describe near death what did you say for tech entrepreneurs yeah 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 or so so I have this saying um, you know I I as a part of learning and developing myself in my craft, which is, you know, being an entrepreneur, being a CEO, I, I study other companies and study, you know, the great companies, the great entrepreneurs through history. And, um, you know, I, I haven't yet come across um, one of these brilliant companies that haven't had at least three near death experiences as a company. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes when, when I'm asked by other founders, and they're going through a rough patch. I, I tell them not to try to uh, avoid the problems, but actually to celebrate the problems because, again, that problems means overcoming those problems means you're creating a lot of value mm -hmm. um, in the end. And and that's my mental trick to kind of allow me to keep going and keep tackling these um, hard issues as they're they're uh, arising on the horizon. So celebrating problems. Okay, Let, let's go there with Joe Rogan because you, you can't get the success you have without having some bumps along the way. And we could certainly describe Joe Rogan as a big old bump. You know, there were many people that were very disappointed and outraged that he was still allowed to remain on your platform. Mm -hmm. He's very controversial, as you know. He's accused of saying some anti-Semitic things, misinformation. H how did you navigate that? What was your thought process in deciding what you were going to do and how you were going to handle Joe Rogan. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's never easy, right? And we've had actually many of these stories with great artists as well around uh, in the history where some artists pulled out and then subsequently came back and so on. So uh, it's never an easy thing and every situation is quite unique. But I think it's important to put this one in particular in context. Um, because we were at the height of a global pandemic. Uh, and obviously people around the world were really scared uh, mm -hmm. about the implications on their safety and health, but also perhaps family members and what would happen to the economy. There were a lot of things that were fluctuating at that very moment. And um, as, as I was dealing with this situation, I was getting advice for left and center. And I, I remember it pretty vividly because I think I was uh, staying up probably for about three or four uh, nights in a row, and not getting much sleep at all, and and eventually I I ended up taking a nine-hour sleep just mm -hmm. in order to think more clearly, and clear uh, your head maybe. Yeah, clear my mm -hmm. head and kind of get back to it, and and it, it 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 wasn't a quick decision by any means, but what I what I sort of centered around was one around this particular issue. The COVID thing, it, it was portrayed as this very black and white um, issue. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, where I come from, Europe and Sweden in particular, if you take something as, uh, um, as child vaccinations, for instance, in most of Europe, for instance, that was not recommended. Um, whereas in America, it was kind of like obvious that you needed to vaccinate your children. And Spotify is a global platform, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I, I highlight this because even the public experts, safety experts around the world, weren't in agreement about what to do. Um, and so this wasn't a black and white issue. This was very much a gray issue where people had very strong views uh, on one side uh, of the aisle and on the other mm -hmm. side of the aisle, etc. And, um, you know, 
as I was looking at this, and I was looking at this as very much a developing situation, um, I had to think about that, but I also had to think about and recenter myself around what kind of platform do we want to be? And I was obviously getting advice from, from um, mm. everywhere around it. And uh, the most important insight I had is I had to be able to be true to myself. And I felt like I had to be able to live with this decision, um, knowing um, I, it, it couldn't just be a smart decision. It had to be a decision I could stand by on a personal grounds as well. And um, where I centered around, around is that I went back to our core values um, as a platform. Spotify is a place where we allow more speech. We allow a huge diversity of voices from all over the world around it. Uh, there are lots of things that are controversial. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Take, for instance, hip hop music, where mm -hmm. the lyrics in hip hop could be highly controversial uh, as well, depending on who's mm -hmm. listening to it. And this doesn't mean that I agree with everything that someone says on the platform. Um, I don't. There are many things that I find offenses, as I'm sure. To you personally. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as I'm sure you do too. But mm -hmm. it's important to me that we have our guidelines. And those guidelines we try to apply unilaterally across the board. And so as we're evaluating a Rogan versus someone else, the big question just comes down to, is this violating our terms of service? Mm -hmm. And if it was, uh, it should be taken down. And if it wasn't, it should remain up. And uh, it's, it's a quite simple principle, but sometimes you get sort of stuck on this because Rogan is the world's number one podcaster, right? Um, but it was important to me that he follows the same rules that we have uh, for everyone else and that this particular moment and heated debates couldn't impact that principle uh, and values that we had as a platform. But he's recently been called out by the Anti-Defamation League for making yet another anti-Semitic comment on the platform. Do you consider some of the things he says to be anti-Semitic? And if so, how do you reconcile that on your platform? Yeah, again, um, I, I find a lot of things uh, that, you know, well, I, I would say I, I find that comment in particular highly offensive. And there are a lot of things that I disagree with that Joe Rogan and lots of other voices are saying on our platform uh, as well. But I come back to it. Is this violating our terms of service or not? And if it is, then we take it down. And mm -hmm. if you take um, um, anti-Semitic comments, we've taken down thousands of podcasts uh, that have um, violated our our, our platform rules and in the broader con context there's probably hundreds of thousands of episodes that are violating other terms of service as well. Mm -hmm. So we do take that very seriously. We're looking at each and every one of these indi individual episodes and look at if it's violating our, our terms of service or not. But the important part here is it's not what I find offensive that goes or doesn't go. There are lots of things that I don't like mm -hmm. and that I disagree with. Mm -hmm. um, by other podcasters as well. We evaluate um, each and every episode um, um, according to that policy, and we have experts uh, and a safety advisory council that take those actions. So it's not me personally that take those actions, but it's that group with um, experts from all sectors, uh, really, that, that uh, make that, those decisions mm -hmm. around each and every time. And, but because you're the face, Daniel, no one says, you know, the experts say it's, yeah. it's directly attributed to you. That's, yeah. the, that's the thinking in the public. And, and I understand that. But I think it's really important that this isn't just um, a decision that's made by me. Uh, it is made by a diverse group of people, too, with, with um, a varied perspective. Because, again, I'm, I'm a guy, white guy from Sweden. I can't know the intricates. Uh, details of every cultural group all over the world too. So we have a very broad team of experts that have been working in these fields for decades mm -hmm. that make these decisions. Mm -hmm. And they evaluate it, and the same rules apply to Joe Rogan as it would to any other podcaster. Mm -hmm. But, but, but how do you handle it, Daniel, when some of your own employees and the audience at large says, Daniel, this is too much, too, too far, you have to do something? How, how do you personally handle that? When people are screaming in the streets, they're offended, they're upset with him, they're upset with you, yeah. they're upset with the platform. You know, what it, do you do? It, it, it's, it's obviously never fun. I mean, it's 
much easier to be well liked by uh, everyone than uh, to have people uh, be very upset and think you're doing the wrong things. Uh, so that's a tough thing you have to work on with yourself. But I guess what I'm trying to say to you, Gail, is that that's, it's never as one-sided as it gets portrayed because as, as much as people are disagreeing with decisions, I'm getting a 10x uh, the amount of that sometimes on the other side too that are agreeing with these things uh, as well. And we have a platform where we're live in 184 countries and territories. Not all of them share the same culture or the same values. So there are lots of voices all over the world that are talking about everything under the sun. And it's not just in podcasting, but the same is true in music too. There are lots of lyrics that I find highly offensive um, as well. But the big thing is that we come back to whether is this violating our uh, policies or not. And if it is, no matter if you're Rogan or another major artist, we will take it down. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, then uh, it will remain up because we believe that more speech mm -hmm. is actually going to uh, propel our society forward uh, and not silencing voices. Do you have to take your own personal inventory during those times, Daniel? How what you, Daniel Eck, believe? Do you have to do that for yourself? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, or, it, it, it's, it's tough. Uh, as I said, there are lots of things that I disagree with at, at some time, but that's why I think it's so important to take that time to reflect, to think. And I think what I keep coming back to, like in the Rogan um, scenario, is I believe in our mission as a company, right? And I believe in why we're here. And I love the fact that there are these diverse uh, voices. And if you go back in history, you know, um, again, and study uh, the true greats, um, whoever they were, the Copernicus of the world or the great inventors, many of their ideas were highly offensive at that time too. And we take them for granted too. When, when the person came along who said, hey, the earth is round, mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to burn him on a cross uh, because everyone thought the world was flat. But it's these ideas too. I think that that debate is important. That doesn't mean everything goes, just to be very clear. Yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, that's why, you know, we have these guidelines where, where if people are, um, you know, subjecting other people to harm, we do take action. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it is important that we are a place uh, that allows a lot of diverse voices to be able to express themselves, to be able to communicate through art. And some are doing it through uh, using parody, some mm -hmm. are doing it being very serious, some are doing it through music, mm -hmm. some are doing it through books mm -hmm. now, and some are doing it through podcasts. And we're, we're a place for all of that. Um, and uh, I, I recenter around that I'm, I'm proud of what we're doing and, and the impact we have on the world. His, it's reported that his contract is up at the end of this year. Will he be renewed? Well, what I can say is um, the contract, I believe, has uh, some more time to go than that. Uh, oh. So we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Have you ever had to talk to him and say, hey, Joe, you need to tone it down a bit. Have you ever done that or you stay out of that too? Um, I, I try to mostly stay out of it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've had conversations with him and uh, uh, I find him to be really thoughtful. I find him to try to learn from um, reactions from people and try to evolve um, his stance too. But I think he's also grappling with this fact of, you know, he went from being sort of just a podcast having fun on the side to now being one of the world's largest voices on all sorts of topics. And mm -hmm. he mostly did this um, to satisfy his own curiosity and have interesting conversations for himself. and. He's uh, now realizing he's uh, having huge impact in the world, yeah. and that's something he's got to be true to himself and uh, evolve his own voice. And that uh, comes with great responsibility, yeah. though. It comes yeah. With, yeah. You know, when you say that you have 500 million listeners, yet there are still reports that Spotify is not profitable. How is that possible? Because the company's hugely successful. You were on the billionaire's list, so you're doing all right when it comes to your own finances but the company still is not profitable. Does that trouble you? Are you worried? And why is it not profitable? Um, I, I'm not really worried about it because it's really within our control. Um, so if we didn't invest as much in that future success uh, as we have been these past few years, we would turn a profit. Um, so it's really a function of us reinvesting in growing. And that growth, of course, gets us to the half a billion and over 200 million paying customers, which then helps the music industry 
and then long term builds a great business. So that's how we've been focused on just reinvesting. And so we could say it was a deliberate choice, Daniel, to was, go for growth over profitability. It True. Was, it was very much a deliberate um, um, uh, target for us. And what we said at our investor day, which we had in June of last year, was that 2022 would be the last year where we'd pursue uh, growth over profitability. And I'll now, bet investors like hearing that. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. They, they, they do. So they're happy to hear that. And uh, now in 2023 and going forward, we will focus more on profitability while still growing. Do you have any doubt that you can be profitable as you sit here today? No, I don't, because it's really within our control. Again, the company is growing nicely um, as it is. Uh, and a as we get leverage, i.e. spend less on marketing, uh, spend less on uh, you know, just rampantly growing our finance functions, legal functions, all those things, uh, then we'll eventually become profitable. Through COVID, did you, what did you learn good and bad through COVID? Did it allow the company to pivot in such a way that you didn't think possible? Yeah, I, I think that there were lots of lessons learned, but I, I don't think we've ever seen consumer habits change as fast in, in history um, as they were during COVID, right? Because we all had to. We all had to, if, if, if you know, people who never try to order online before had to all of a sudden order online, right? Um, and, you know, again, normally, um, for instance, with Spotify, one of the big places that people listened to Spotify was in the car. Uh, but since people no longer commuted to work, <laughs> yeah. uh, that disappeared. And instead, people started consuming in their home. Um, and even the kind of contents people were consuming was different. Uh, we saw mindfulness rising mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. as a very big thing people were focusing on. And then, um, you know, daily news shows, as an example, uh, in the beginning did really well, but in the end, people got tired of hearing uh, the doomsday scenarios um, painted out and went for mindfulness instead. So there were lots and lots of consumer habits that changed in a very, very short period of time. Um, let's talk about the, the changes with Spotify. When people wake up very soon this week, and they go to Spotify, it will look different for them. Yeah. How so? And well, what did it take for you to say, we need to be different because? But what will they see that's different? Well, so so uh, there's a number of new updates um, uh, that we're announcing really today. Um, one of them is an entirely new home feed. So uh, completely redesigned from the ground up. You'll see Spotify, I think, come alive. You're going to see a lot more interactive content. You're going to see clips of content that might be really interesting to you, that's being recommended to you. Uh, and you're going to be able to see uh, visual components, for instance, clips and videos that people are uploading with that content too. We'll so, be able to scroll. That's and you're going to be right? able to scroll, scroll through the, those clips to find interesting content for you. So that's the first change. Um, the second big change uh, we actually announced already two weeks ago, but we're rolling it out to more people is uh, what we call AI DJ. Very cool. Uh, which is super I already cool. got mine, yeah, very That's cool. amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's my favorite too. Um, and uh, what it really is, is imagine having like your own personal DJ um, that knows your music taste, knows uh, what kind of music you're liking, and is able to give you context around why you're hearing that songs and putting together the perfect uh, sort of music but Daniel, for the right moment. AI DJ does not sound like a robot. It sounds like a real person. Yes. <laughs> did you do that on purpose? Yes, we did. We we, we did the, <laughs> do that, that on, on pur <laughs> uh, purpose. And and in fact, it's actually a real person too. Um, and what do you mean? Yeah. So so it's built on a real live individual. Uh, his name is we call him X Xavier. Um, so he's a Spotify employee. Oh, he's an employee. Yeah. Oh. That's that's been around for forever. Uh, we used him for. I want to meet him. Yeah, well, uh, well, we'll make sure. <laughs> I have you a get picture in my head of what he looks like, so I'm curious. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, he's so a real person. Very he's cool. a real person, and it started out because he he were emceeing uh, a lot of our internal events here, uh, and um, you know, uh, it kind of dawned upon us that hey, having him uh, be our personal DJ wouldn't that be cool? And then we were playing around with it for the beta, and we loved it so much that we asked him if it was okay. Uh, to actually use and did he say hmm yes <laughs> yeah he, he was super excited you didn't about have it. to twist his arm because no. it's such a fun job 
I, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. But uh, you know, it was important that he was okay with it. Yes, and, of course. And uh, we we uh, we had fun while doing it. And it's it's it, it's amazing because this version of X now, this AI DJ, is talking about all sorts of things that the real life X never said. Yeah. Right. And that's the amazing thing now because it is making it personal to you, Gail. Yes. But it's like he knows me looking at my feed. Exactly and he makes right. very good recommendations. Exactly yeah. right. And and uh, it's it's funny because I was talking to him before about this and now people come up to him uh, and tell him uh, like, oh, you recommended such amazing music. And obviously he has no idea because yeah. he never said those things in, in real life. Uh, so it's funny to see how we're all kind of getting confused yes. about uh, what's happening in the background. But it's an amazing product that I can't wait for people to try out. The AI technology, does it scare you in any way? Um, it, it does and it doesn't. Um, so I, I, I think on a broader scale, uh, it is, it is kind of crazy to imagine um, what the world may look like in five or 10 years if we go to what people call AGI, artificial general intelligence, which basically means that you have an AI that might be smarter than any human alive, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of daunting to think about what the consequences might be for humanity um, uh, as we're there. And I think we have to be very careful about it. But at the same time, uh, on the other side, it's also so obvious that AI can help so much by making, um, you know, both experiences better and easier uh, for all of us to deal with. And that's pretty much in every single field. Did you make the scrolling and the videos because of TikTok? Were you looking at TikTok going, we got to do something about this? Well, you've got to change with the program. Was that part of it? Well, um, it wasn't so much around a specific um, sort platform. of platform, but mm -hmm. rather kind of looking at what young consumers do. There you go. Um, one, of, one of the big things for me is um, you have to live in the future. Uh, and for me, the future is always uh, the young people. What are they doing in various cultures? And I would say as an industry, every few years, um, in the industry, someone brings something out uh, from a design perspective that's just much, much better way uh, for people to interact uh, with it. And, um, you know, Snap, for instance, did that with stories. And now almost every platform mm -hmm. has stories. And TikTok obviously did that with the discovery feed as well. So we're definitely taking inspiration from that. But we're adding a unique Spotify twist uh, on it, too. So I don't want people to think that we're making this to be like TikTok. We're making it to be a much more interactive Spotify. Do you think a lot about the future? Is that how your brain works? You think about the future? Um, I, I, I don't know that, I, that I'm sort of forcing myself to think about the future per se, but uh, I'm constantly thinking about how how, you know, what people are doing. I'm observing uh, what people are doing and I'm constantly thinking about how one can improve those things. Um, and, and in doing so, you kind of tend to live in the future anyway, because most of those things um, may be there. Um, you know, there's, I think it was Bill Gates who said it, but, but it's a quote I like very much. And he says that the, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, and I believe in that a lot. So I think you can, can, if you're looking at what people are doing around the world, I think in many cases you already see the future. We just all haven't experienced it yet. And um, that's my source of inspiration as I think about innovation. How important are podcasts to the Spotify platform? It's, it's, it's really huge, Gail. Um, you know, Over music? No, it's not over music. I mean, um, my background and where we started was music, and it's always going to be our core. Um, but it's a huge way because um, one of the things that I realized as well is that they're additive to each other. It's not instead of, um, you know, if you think about it, like what would happen if you in the car only had music and no talk? Um, well, you know people are going to ask about the weather, they're gonna ask about traffic report, they're gonna ask about news, they're gonna ask about a bunch of different things. And so what we realized is that these two things together actually means people will spend more time on music and more time on talk. Mm -hmm. And we could see that immediately from when we launched it too. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's critical, I think, going forward um, that we have both of these 
uh, amazing classes mm -hmm. uh, of creators on mm -hmm. the platform. So are you musically inclined? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm musically inclined for sure. I, I, I started playing guitar when I was like four or five. Oh, and so you can play the guitar. Okay, yeah, good. so so that's my kind of main instrument. Uh, and I love music, but the truth is I just wasn't good enough to make it in music. Um, that's the reality. But that doesn't mean that I don't love it. And uh, for me, you know, when I started Spotify, um, my dream was to be able to uh, combine my two big loves, which is technology and computers on the one hand and music. And that's why I started doing Spotify. It wasn't because it was this sort of great uh, business idea. Music and, and technology. Yeah. Yeah, because you were a big coder. That's your, you were yeah. a huge coder. I mean, there's a story about you hacking the high school computers. Is that true? Uh, it's probably true. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> probably shouldn't have been. What were it, you but. looking for? What were you looking for? Did you do, just do it for the hell of it, the fun of it? What yeah, were you it was for? like fun to prank the teachers uh, <laughs> because you could get sort of like fart sounds out of the computers and fart like, sounds. Yeah, you know, was some, some sort <laughs> Daniel, of, that's so mature and so classy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Fart sounds yeah. out of the computer. I was, uh, you know, I was fourteen at the time, <laughs> yes. so I, I, I should say that. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But, but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it was always around that. I was always either dealing music with uh, music or I was dealing with computers and I couldn't really pick. So so when I got lucky enough to have the option of like deciding what I wanted to do uh, in my life, um, I had a successful company that I was able to sell before Spotify. And that uh, meant that I didn't have to sort of immediately go and um, find out what I wanted to do. I I, I knew I wanted to do music and I wanted to do technology, but um, you know, to set the scene, the music industry was going right like this, and everyone told me this is a horrible thing. You can never make money in this thing. Uh, it's never going to be a, a big business. Please don't do that. Go and do something else instead. But that was my passion. I know, but Daniel, how cool is it that you got to combine your passions and make money doing it and be a success? So that's at 22. That was your dream. As you sit here at 40. Um, you're still still really young in the world. What's your dream now at 40? Well, my, my, my dream is um, really to build. I, I feel like we're, we're still early in this journey on Spotify. And, and the amazing thing is we get to deal with some of the most creative uh, and inspirational humans on the planet, right? And um, whether you're just starting out or whether you're already established, if we can build like the best place for those creators um, where they can grow their audience, where they can engage um, with their fans and monetize it. I, I really believe that uh, those storytellers, that um, those educators, those artists, um, those are, are the people that will make people feel things, will make people grow and, and learn and develop themselves. And if we can be that place, um, where um, people get inspired uh, and grow as human beings, but also have uh, help these amazing creative storytellers. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty amazing thing to contribute to the world.